In this video, we're going to talk about risk. Risk involves uh, a looking at a disease that is in, in a binary, from a binary point of view. For example, you either have the coronavirus or you don't. You're either pregnant or you're not. In this case, we're going to be looking at glaucoma and whether or not you meet a certain criteria for getting or for having glaucoma. And then what we want to know is or the question that we're asking is whether or not taking drops before you have, um, before you've actually developed the disease, can you take drops to lower your blood pressure in order to prevent getting the disease? And so we're going to look at the ocular hypertension treatment study. This is a really pretty good study. It's uh, a very large trial randomized. We'll get into that in a second. So as we've said before, when we are uh, reading a paper, we first look at the title, does it, does it apply? And we were looking for papers that had to do with um, taking drops and lowering ocular hypertension, IOP. Um, look at the title, select your paper, then look at the abstract. So we're going to look at the abstract, then we're going to look at the tables and figures, then we're going to decide on the conclusions. All right, so at this point I could pause and say read or ask you to read the abstract, but I think for this video we'll try reading the abstract together. So uh, we have the paper in front of us and the first you can notice that the abstract is broken down into sections. There's a background and objective methods the outcome measures that they were used, the results, and, and conclusions. So uh, first, with the background, uh, primary open angle glaucoma, POAG, is one of the leading causes of blindness in the United States and worldwide. Three to six million people in the United States are at increased risk for developing POAG because of elevated intraocular pressure, IOP, or ocular hypertension. There is no consensus on the efficacy of medical treatment in delaying or preventing the onset of POAG in individuals with elevated IOP. Therefore, we designed a randomized clinical trial, the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study. So then the primary objective is to determine the safety and efficacy of topical ocular hypertension, hypertensive, hypotensive medication in delaying or preventing the onset of POAG. These are basically drops. And so methods, a total of 1,636 participants with no evidence of glucotomous damage aged 40 to 80 years and with an IOP between 24 and 32 milligrams um, in or millimeters pressure in one eye and between 21 and 32 in the other eye. They, these people were randomized to either observation or treatment with commercially available topical ocular hypertensive hypotensive medication. The goal in the medication group was to reduce IOP by 20% or more and to reach an IOP of 24 or less. So um, we can consider a few things out of this method section. First, the design of the study randomized controlled trial. The large number of participants would lead us to believe that this design is A, would be rated an A, get a grade of A. Because this, this is a good study. It's also, if we went into the methods, it's a multi-center study. It has a, looks at a broad range of people. But one of the interesting things is it's not measuring a specific or testing a specific drug. It's, it's um, looking at any drug any drop that lowers hypertension, hypo, hypertension, yeah. So it's a hypotensive drug that is designed to lower hype, 
hypertension. And it's, it's looking at people in the age range where they're um, going to start where the increase in glaucoma is starting to show up, those people that are 40 to 80 years old. So main outcome measures, what are they looking at to test this? The primary outcome was the development of reproducible visual field abnormality or reproducible optic disc deterioration attributed to POAG. Abnormalities were determined by masked certified readers at the reading centers and attribution to POAG was decide, decided by the masked endpoint committee. So this is really good. They're, they're giving people the information about each patient and the people that are evaluating the uh, outcomes don't know whether they were in the treatment or the uh, placebo group. And not even a placebo because it didn't give them anything, just the uh, group that was observational. All right, results. During the course of the study, the mean and standard deviation reduction in IOP in the medication group was 22.5%, plus or minus 9.9%. So that's um, that's percentage reduction. The IOP declined by 4% in the observation group. So the observation group went down a little bit, but not much compared to 22.5%. But that's not, um, this, this is a good statistic, and we should look at the effect size of this. But for, for uh, purposes of risk, we're going to um, look more at the next uh, test. So at 60 months, five years, and I think this study went on for seven years, we'll see in a minute, the cumulative probability of developing POAG was 4.4% in the medication group and 9.5% in the observation group. And this uses what's called a hazard ratio because they're looking at changes over time. It's equivalent to a relative risk. And hopefully you've read the relative risk brief. If you haven't, you should probably do that before continuing. And the 95% confidence interval was 0 0.27 to 0.59, p less than 0 0.001. There was little evidence of increased systemic or ocular risk associated with hyp ocular hypotensive medication. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. What have we shown here? Um, we can bring in a little spreadsheet here. So if we, rather than use the hazard ratio, we just calculate the, um, the relative risk, we have um, a 0.044 or 4.4 percent divided by 0 0.095 percent of those people that, so 4.4 got uh, proceeded on to glaucoma. Uh, we should probably talk a little bit first about the visual field and what they're what they're looking at there, or the reduction in the IO in the uh, optic disc. So the idea behind uh, glaucoma is that your retinal ganglion cells are deteriorating, and when that happens, the nerves going into, through the optic disc, start to, uh, they die, or the retinal ganglion cells send nerve systems, uh, nerve signals down the optic disc, the um, neurons go through that to the brain. And as your um, retinal ganglia cells uh, deteriorate, that optic disc has fewer fibers and so it decreases. That fiber layer that's going through that hole gets smaller. 
well, the hole gets bigger. The fibers are fewer. The other thing is that your visual field. So you go into an instrument, or you look at an instrument that has a, um, you, you look at it, it has peripheral versus central or and central vision, and you it's a little bright light that flashes on, and you have to see whether or not you saw it. And and as your as your retinal ganglia cells die, they miss those little bright lights. So the question is, are you able to see them? And then the computer plots out a map of your visual field and shows where you're missing it, missing stuff. So I have this panel that looks at these drawings. Now later in the methods section, it also says that you have to have this two or three times in, a, in two or three consecutive visits. And then they, if after three consecutive visits, you have still have a problem, they'll say you had glaucoma at the first visit. So that's how they measure it. And 4.4% of the people that were taking the medication had developed glaucoma versus the reference observational group that had 9.5. And this is a relative risk. It's the risk if you um, have the medication, it's a risk if you don't. And the ratio is 0.46. Now, if they were equal, they were both, say, 5%, or if they were both 9%, then that ratio would be 1, and there'd be no difference between the groups. But this is less than 1, and so it shows that the drops were protective. And uh, another thing about the confidence interval is that you notice it's 0.27 to 0.59. Both the lower and the upper confidence intervals are less than 1. And that's why the significance of the p-value is 0 0.001. And given this statistic, um, the probability of, of finding um, or of having the probability of getting this value when the null hypothesis is true, which is one in this case, um, is very small. And so they have found a significant difference. But, but the effect size in terms of risk is the, is the hazard ratio or the relative risk. You'll notice their um, hazard ratio was 0.4 whereas ours was 0.46, and that's because they actually controlled for a few things. The hazard ratio, it gets that number uh, a little bit differently. The, the, the premise is basically the same. It's the ratio at a given instant in time for that, but they have data that goes over all the time. We'll see what the data looks like in a minute as we go through the figures. Okay, now on this one, we're going to, so our, we basically, if, if you don't take the drops, you're like two times as likely to develop glaucoma. If you take the drug, you're half as likely to develop glaucoma. Those two sentences, statements are the same thing. You're twice as likely to get it if you don't, and you're half as likely to get it if you do take the drops. Now that's pretty impressive, but um, what we want to do next is look at attributable risk. If you don't do anything, you're going to have 9% glaucoma. But even if you do take the drops, 4.4% of the people are going to have glaucoma. And the difference is 5%. Now, um, we can ignore this minus sign. It's just the direction that I plotted those in um, that gives us a minus sign. But um, so there's a 5% attributable risk to taking the drops. That means that um, the drops save you, save 5% of the people from getting glaucoma. 
And there's a handy little measure called number needed to treat, which is the reciprocal of this number. So if you take 1 and you divide it by 0.051, you get 19.6, um, or about 20. And what that means that is that if you, if you find a, if you have a patient in your chair and they're 40 to 80 years old, and their IOP is 24 or above, then, or in that range that was in there, then um, you need 20 people in your chair that meet those conditions in order to save one from getting glaucoma. All right. Um, so this is our relative risk, the ratio, the attributable risk, the number needed to treat. I thought just as kind of a review, the, they talked about the mean and standard deviation reduction in IOP and the percentage. Um, I kind of really rather do it by the actual values, but this is what we have here. So 22.5% with a standard deviation 9.9. .9 reduction for medication, 4, and 11.6 standard deviation for the observation group. So that's 22 and 4, 9.9 .9 standard deviations and 11. We come up here and we look that we're taking 22, 22 minus 4, and then dividing that by the average of the standard deviation. And we get a difference, an effect size of 1.7. Remember, we have said that the clinical relevance minimum, minimum clinical relevance is 0.5. Well, this is really a lot bigger than that. Uh, if we talk about the difference in height between men and women optometry students, that difference is about two and a half standard deviations. So you can see that it's not quite as big a difference as the difference between height and men and women, but it's a pretty big difference in terms of reduction. All right. Um, and then they didn't have didn't seem to have much in the way of side effects. So their conclusion was that topical ocular hypotensive medication was effective in delaying or preventing the onset of POAG in individuals with elevated IOP. Although this does not imply that all patients with borderline or elevated IOP should receive medication, clinicians should consider initiating treatment for individuals with ocular hypertension who are at moderate or high risk of developing POAC. So the, we're kind of left with the idea that you meet these conditions of uh, being over 40, less than 80, and with an I, IOP between 24 and 32, or 21 and 32, and another eye, that, um, you know, this would probably cut down, would, would, re, would lead to 5% fewer people, the attributable risk, 5% fewer people not getting um, glaucoma. All right. So in reviewing our papers, we said you look at the title, you look at the abstract, then you look at the figures. So let's go down through and see what um, data, the tables and figures, see what we have here. All right, the first table or figure is this is just a chart showing the, uh, the design and it's randomized and this is what they did and they, during this period they had some people die in the um, observational group, 29 and 26 died in the medication. Loss to follow-up was 84 and 89. 
uh, completed trial was 706 and 702. So that's actually pretty good in terms of uh, balancing between that. One thing that you would look in this is if you lost a whole lot of people in this medication group because you know they didn't like the drops or didn't like taking drops, whatever, then um, then you would basically be biasing your final result. Um, so the loss to follow-up is about the same, number of died is about the same, so this is a really pretty good study in terms of the, this, the design being an introduction to bias. All right, and then down here, table one, we look at the baseline characteristics of the people. And it, it's, these are all the things that they looked at. Um, table one in papers is usually a talk about baseline levels. Who was in the study? What did they look like? This is what people looked like. 35% were 36% were 40 to 50 years old. 6% um, were over 70. The race was predominantly white, with African Americans coming in second. All right. Now this is a plot of the IOPs. So this is baseline when they first came in and they were measured. You can see there the two groups were pretty much the same thing, which randomly they could have been different, but they weren't in this case. Uh, if you had done a study where you didn't randomize them and you just selected people that had drops versus people who didn't have drops, you'd probably find a big difference here because the people that were getting drops already had um, some hypertension and those that weren't, uh, maybe not so much. But you can see that the effect of drops, the drops were basically pretty effective in the first six months. This is, uh, these are months. So in the first, and there, you can see they're measured twice a year. Zero, six months, 12, 18, 24, and so forth. Um, looks like they were followed out six years. So five years at 60 months, then six. All right, so the drops didn't continually get better or worse. If you were in the observation group, you mostly stayed the same over the period. That's pretty consistent. So let's figure two. Table two, what is this? So intraocular pressure at baseline and follow-up and medication reported by race. So we have African Americans, we have others, we have all. We have the medication group and the observation group. IOP at baseline for African Americans was a little higher than the others, uh, and that was in both the medication and the observation. IOP averaged across uh, scheduled follow-up visits. Uh, we're actually in the medication group. We're pretty similar in the um, in the medication. Yeah, in the observation, also pretty similar. They went down a little bit. Just by being in the study, they got a little bit better. All right. And looking down here. Uh, percentage of medication participants prescribed each class of medication. So there's these different types of hypotensive drugs. And this is just showing um, the number of people taking them. You notice these lines are not straight across, which you would kind of expect them to be. Uh, they mostly started here with beta adrenergic antagonists, but then they switched out to others with this, um, it looks like maybe prostaglandin, it's hard to tell, uh, was the most common drug people ended up on. Just as there was no... the individual optometrists, ophthalmologists could pick whatever eye drop, type of eye drop they wanted. Um, 
they could also, if it wasn't working or if it wasn't getting where they wanted it to be, they could try a different drug. Okay, table three, progress and outcome of study participants, medication observed and overall. Uh, this is how many were randomized, they died, became inactive, non-adherence. Um, non-adherence means that they stopped taking the drops or in the observation group, they started taking drops. Um, and this is the percent that developed reproducible visual field abnormality and developed reproducible field or optic disc deterioration. This is where they got their, their final result. Now, I should say that when they did the hazard ratio, they had various controls on age, sex, and race, etc. In this one, uh, the, the first endpoint that fired off, in other words, visual field was the first problem in 15 versus 29. Optic disc was then seen. Concurrent visual field and optical disc were seen on the same visit. And that's the total number of people. This is the proportion of participants developing POAC. So if they had both of these conditions, I don't know if you need both of them, but um, if the visual field was bad or the optic disc was bad, they were said to have POAG. And this curve here, you can see it's, it's gathering the percentage of people that they're getting as a higher number. And that is the observation group and the um, medication group is lower. And at six, 60 months or five years, you know, we're looking right about here. After that, people started to take off. Okay, so we have six years and then there's seven years. So as people, these, the number of people being measured here at 84 months is less than the number of people being measured here. So we're starting to, our, our sample is becoming a little biased as we lose our representation, but um, things really take off. So most of the data that they use, they're using it while it's still a pretty consistent straight line. And this plot is called a Kaplan-Meier plot. And they look at the people at risk so your at-risk is a nominator is 819 at the beginning, and then it goes down as people either develop POAG, they die, or they're out of the study. And so the denominator gets smaller, where at the end, at 84 months, there's only 204 people there. Uh, the medication group, there's 210, but you can see this number of people that are dropping out. So this curve is based on this dropout, and that's kind of the hazard ratio takes that into account as it's going along. That's why it's a little bit different than just saying, calculating the relative risk at 60 months, which is what we did in our little Excel sample. This is showing... Um, uh, this the uh, symptoms uh, side effects at one or more and the little black dots are the medication and the circles are the observations not that much different and these are all the kinds of symbols of uh, symptoms you could get okay that's pretty much it so, um, up here someplace, I guess I didn't highlight it in this copy. They conclude that it's effective in reducing the incidence of glaucoma. And they would kind of leave you with the impression <coughs> that if you find somebody in your practice that meets these criteria. So they're over 40 years old, 
um, they find a clinically significant effect of taking the medication, then it seems like it would be a good idea to give the drops. But you guys are doctors. You are not technicians that just say, oh, okay, this is better, let's just do it. You have to think about your patient and what are the, the uh, circumstances. So I'd like to introduce an editorial. And we'll talk about a few of these things. This is also in your a list of papers for you to look at. Now, I'm pretty much just going to tell you what this says rather than read through the whole thing. But the basic gist of the argument is that glaucoma is a disease that develops slowly. It first affects the periphery, and then it works its way in to the central. So your vision is not really affected all that much when it's just in the periphery. Think about your blind spot. Your blind spot puts a big hole in your visual field and you can see it on a visual field test because you don't if you if you flash a light where the optic disc is, you're not going to see it because there's no retinal ganglia cells there. It's a big hole. Yet when you look at this video, you don't see a big hole in the middle of the screen that you have to work around. You're not blind. Your brain fills in the rest. Well, with glaucoma in early stages, your brain fills in the picture. And you're not really blinded. It's only when it starts hitting the central that you start, your vision starts becoming limited. And fortunately, the disease itself starts at the periphery and, and works its way in. And it does that over a long period of time. So, if when you first notice a person has IOP with no symptoms of glaucoma, their visual field test is fine, their optic disc ratio is fine, um, this study has shown that if you start medications, you can reduce the number of people progressing to glaucoma by 5%. That's one out of every 20. Well, giving the drug to one out of 20 people means that you're going to give people a lifetime prescription, whatever age they start until they die, of taking drops when 19 of them aren't going to go up. They'll die before they become blind. And so is that a good idea? Well, the the writers of this editorial suggest perhaps not that um, the disease progresses slowly enough you can track them you should surely keep let them know they are at risk for glaucoma and that you as a physician are going to follow them and when it looks like they're going to start to develop the disease then they'll treat it now, I don't know if anybody has done a study for this strategy or not to see if waiting until um, the horse is out of the barn, if you will, that the people have already started to develop glaucoma, if that works. But um, glaucoma medication isn't free. Uh, it, it costs a lot to... Um, to give to each of those sets of 20 people to save one of them from blindness. Uh, and most of the others are going to die before they become blind. So even if they have glaucoma. So the argument here is you need to consider the cost of the therapy, um, when it's going to hit, and... Uh, so maybe even though this was a really good study, a big study that was clinically significant, you still have to put on your doctor hat and 
decide, is are drops best for my patient or should I just follow them? All right, so that's, that's risk.